I think it is appropriate to begin now. And I'd like to begin with a few expressions of gratitude. This event is jointly sponsored by the Departments of Pathology and Genetics. And it's one of our series of events jointly spon um, it's one of our series of lectures in the celebration of uh, Darwin and evolution. I want to specifically thank Derek Abbott, the director of the Pathology Seminar Series, Mark Adams, our contact in uh, genetics, and Natalie Wheeler and Susie Brill for administrative support. And I also want to acknowledge the efforts of the other members of the so-called Darwin Committee. Our guest speaker today, Jerry Coyne of the University of Chicago, began his uh, higher education at the College of William and Mary. Apparently, he sufficiently impressed both William and Mary and the Graduate Admissions Committee at Harvard that he was able to pursue his graduate studies with Richard Lewinton, a leading population geneticist and evolutionary thinker. It was in a course on population genetics uh, by Jerry's men offered by Jerry's mentor that I met Jerry and began to follow his career. After completing his PhD with Professor Lewinton, Jerry pursued postdoctoral studies with Timothy Proud at University of California at Davis. Jerry then took a faculty position at the University of Maryland, and after four years in promotion to associate professor, he moved to the University of Chicago in 1986. And in 1991, he assumed uh, the rank of professor in the Department of uh, Ecology and Evolution at Chicago. With the dry biographical detail out of the way, I can briefly address my motivation for extending an invitation to Jerry. As, as one of the organizers of the celebration of Darwin and evolution, I wanted to bring to campus uh, a series of speakers with expertise on issues of significance in evolutionary biology so that they could inform the members of the academic community and interested members of the broader community um, about the breadth and depth of evolutionary science. Jerry is an especially, pro especially promising candidate to fulfill these tandem goals. He is a leading evolutionary geneticist and authority on speciation. In addition, he is possessed of a critical intellect and consequently he has been a participant in a number of real evolutionary debates uh, with eminent antagonists such as Stephen Jay Gould and most recently Sean Carroll. His dispute with Professor Carroll, uh, an earlier and engaging participant in our series of uh, Darwin and Evolution talks, pertains to the topic of the presentation that we are uh, looking forward to this afternoon. I want to note that Jerry has also published numerous book reviews and commentaries for a general audience pertaining to evolution, and he has a book, Why Evolution is True, due out early uh, next year in 2009. So without further delay, I am delighted to invite Jerry to the lectern to deliver his address, The Locus of Evolution, Evo Devo, and the Genetics of Adaptation. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. It's a bit unnerving to hear yourself described as a promising candidate for a lecture, because <laughs> if you don't deliver, you're screwed. <laughs> it's also interesting to hear the introductions get longer and longer, which means you're getting older and older over the years. Um, my talk today is only tangentially Darwinian in the sense that it's not classical evolutionary biology. Um, the stuff I'm going to talk about was not, in fact, known or appreciated by Darwin. It's all fairly new. But it's about a topic that was of interest to him, and it's uh, genetics of adaptation. Now, Darwin didn't know anything about genetics because he didn't know what a gene was, um, and he misapprehended how it worked. But he did talk about inheritance, and he had a very definite idea of how the genetics of inheritance worked, which was that adaptations were the result of many, many tiny factors of small effect accumulating over time. Okay, but he didn't know what they were. Um, now we know that they're genes. And we have a much more sophisticated view of the genetics of adaptation. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, in particular one aspect of it. What are the genes that are undergoing change to cause adaptations to evolve? Um, the first thing I want to do is get clear um, what we mean by the genetics of adaptation. And it's basically the genetic changes that are responsible for what we know or what we think of as features that enhance the fitness or the ability of an organism to survive in its environment, which include not only these obvious adaptations like the camel's hump or the shape of the cactus, but things that are involved in sexual selection. There's a bower bird female looking at a male spreading its tail, pretty bizarre feature. Um, so it's the genetic basis of how you develop these things that is the genetics of adaptation. And what we mean by that is how many genes are involved in creating features like this, where are they located on the chromosomes? What effect they have? Do these genes have big effects or small effects, the allelic substitutions? And finally, in the topic of today's lecture is, um, what are the kinds of genes, the precise genetic changes, that are involved in making these adaptations? As I said, um, Darwin didn't know what genes were, but his view was that 
what makes an adaptation is, is many, many, maybe hundreds or thousands of small substitutions of very small effect, although he didn't know how genetics worked. We know a lot more about it today. Um, in particular, the controversy I'm going to address is something that I guess John Carroll didn't talk much about when he was here, but that he's been deeply involved in, um, as have I, for the, but through only one paper, and that is um, what is the role of reg the regulation of genes as opposed to changes in the structural genes themselves in creating these adaptive changes. And the whole sort of controversy or dichotomy of views about what kinds of genetic change make adaptations was started by uh, Jacob and Monod when they did their famous work on gene regulation in the 1950s. And Jacot, in particular, became Im interested in the implication of his discoveries for evolution because he was somewhat of a polymath. And in the 50s and in, in this later paper, which is published in 1972, his view was that, and well, it's, it's boxed here, what makes one vertebrate different from another, and presumably he thinks invertebrates as well, is a change in the time of expression and in the relative amounts of gene products rather than the small differences observed in the structure of these products. So here's an explicit statement that it's not the change in the gene product itself that's making adaptations, changes in vertebrates, but the relative amounts of the gene products and the time that they're expressed. So it's the regulation of genes rather than the changes in what they produce themselves that is the stuff of evolution. Um, this was given further impetus at about the same time by this very famous paper by um, Mary Claire King and Alan Wilson in Science, Evolution in Two Levels at Humans and Chimpanzees, where they summarized all the data about, that existed at the time about the similarity in DNA sequence between humans and chimps. And they, had, they sort of came up with this result that was surprising at the time, that there was a 99% similarity in the DNA of humans and chimps. So we only have a 1% difference in DNA sequence. And um, that figure is held up pretty well. It's now 98.5. But yeah, there is this sort of striking similarity between ourselves and our closest relatives. And their view was that's real similarity, 1% difference. It must be that there are a few key changes in genes that are involved in this difference between ourselves and chimps. And, for, and they imputed those differences to the regulation of genes themselves just like Jacot did. There, here's the sort of abstract. Their macromolecules are so much alike, DNA, protein, streak sequence, et cetera, that regulatory mutations may account for their biological differences. So here again is the proposition that the change in gene regulation, rather than the gene products themselves, is what makes a human different from a chimp. OK, this is the most interesting of all biological differences. In their case, they proposed that the changes in regulation were actually affected by genes moving around through inversions or translocations on the chromosome. So when you move the gene from one place to another, that would affect its regulation and how it would be turned on, how much product it made, where it was expressed. And that caused maybe things like hairiness and opposable thumbs, et cetera. I mean, it was all speculation, but this paper caused a lot of excitement because of the two propositions. First of all, our profound similarity with our closest relative genetically. And second of all, the idea that maybe regulatory differences, changes in the timing or expression of a few key genes, was the stuff of evolution. Okay. So since then, the field of evo-devo has grown up, which is basically the incorporation of developmental biology into evolutionary biology. And one of the propositions that has probably gained the most notoriety or publicity from um, the evo-devo camp is the similarity in views with Alan Wilson and King and with Jacob that the changes in gene regulation rather than the changes in what a gene makes are really the important stuff in evolution. So here we see a morphing from sort of the position of a gene that King and Wilson maintained to changes in regulatory sequences. Here's a quote from Sean Carroll. Changes in regulatory sequence are so often the basis for the evolution of form. Note that he's talking about animal form or shape here rather than other things like physiology or biochemistry. That when considering the evolution of anatomy, including neural circuitry, regulatory sequence evolution should be the primary hypothesis considered. OK, that is, the null hypothesis for what makes an adaptive change, at least in body plan, is changes in gene regulation. I don't have to read all these things out. You can read them yourself off the slide. Um, this is a statement by Eric Davidson, who's a developmental geneticist, I believe in Caltech. In, the, in this case, the change in sequence of a regulation has morphed into a yet more narrower view of what is really changing during evolution. It's now changed in the cis-regulatory DNA linkages that are required for adaptive evolution. 
And so this is the cis-regulatory variation, that is, the changes in the elements that are cis-regulatory in the five prime region of a gene that regulate it, the changes in those regions are what makes animals and plants different from one another. That is, that's the basis of adaptive change. Okay, here's another statement by Jim Valentine, who's a paleontologist. Again, from the origin of body plans, cis-regulatory elements appear to have been preeminent. Note that this presumes that there's a lot of data that supports this statement, okay? Because these are very declarative statements about how the world is. Here's Austin Hughes, is a Drosophila geneticist. Cis-regulatory, we have direct evidence that cis-regulatory evolution plays a major role. And finally, this is uh, Sean Carroll's first popular book um, in which he claims that mice and humans, well, it's true, have nearly identical sets, well, it's not quite that true, have nearly identical sets of 25,000 genes. And since the kinds of genes are shared between man and mouse, that is the switches that encode structure instructions unique to individual species that enable different animals to be made using essentially the same toolkits. So here's the proposition now presented to the public, not just to other scientists, that is the changes in how, when, and where genes are turned on and off, the switches that are the important thing in evolution. It's not what the genes actually make themselves, okay? So the, when you change from whiskers to a beard or you lose your tail and stop squeaking and start speaking, that's due not to changes in the gene products themselves, but to when they're turned on and off. Okay, what I wanna do today is sort of attack this proposition, not because it's wrong, or not because we have data that definitively show that gene regulation doesn't play a major role in evolution, but to, to make a simple claim, which is that we don't have enough information to make that claim about it, that we actually don't know a lot about what kinds of genetic change occur in evolution. So I sort of want to impose an uh, aura of agnosticism over the audience rather than the certainty that you've seen in those previous slides by both geneticists and paleontologists and Evo Devo people. So I'm gonna to try to convince you that we know a lot less than we think we do, which shouldn't be that hard, uh, I hope. Um, so I wanna start out with just a few definitions. What do we mean by gene regulation? Um, first of all, it's a change in the amount, the timing, or the location of a gene product. Okay, that's, that's all well and good, it's easy to understand. It's not the nature of the product itself, it's how, when, and where it's expressed, okay? Now, this is a little bit more complicated from our, the early Evo Devo people claimed that there were two types of genetic change that caused organismal change and adaptations. One was changes in structural genes and, reg, and the other was changes in regulatory genes. So this is changes in genes that actually each gene, I conceive of a gene as something that makes a protein product. Some genes are there for, to build bodies and make structures and other genes are there to regulate other genes. And this is the way that the debate was first conceived of originally. Now what I want to say is um, that that's really not a good way to conceive of the debate because it's hard to take a single gene that does something and say whether that's a structural gene or a regulatory gene. Just because the developmental network in many cases, not all, but in many cases is so complicated that genes that are involved in building bodies also have other functions in which they turn on or off other genes or express other genes. And the genes that are involved in expressing other genes likewise can be used as structural components. And I'll just have two examples here. Um, I'm a bit handicapped because I know a lot of the audience knows a lot more of this stuff than I do um, because I'm not, a, I'm not a developmental biologist, I'm an evolutionist. Histones, when I was younger, were thought to be structural proteins, that is, they made up sort of maybe a backbone of DNA. We now know that they have regulatory functions as well. Um, they have catalytic functions and other, you know, there's a the complex of different things that are involved in. Uh, beta catenin, I think it's catenin as it's pronounced. See, I don't even know how to pronounce these genes. It's a protein that's involved in, in cell adhesion, so it's sort of a structural protein, but it also has a catalytic function as well, and you can separate these functions mutationally. That is, you can make mutations. Some mutations of the protein will affect its ability for cells to adhere to each other. Other mutations don't affect that ability, but affect its ability to regulate other genes. So you get all balled up when you're trying to figure out if a gene is a regulatory gene or a structural gene, and you just get bogged down in semantics instead of answering the question about what kind of genetic change is important in evolution. So um, what I would like to conceive of is there's an easier way to answer the question that was posed by King and Wilson and Jacob, and that's to conceive not of structural versus regulatory genes, but structural versus regulatory mutations, okay? And I will propose that a structural mutation is simply a mutation that changes the sequence of a protein. It occurs within the coding region, 
um, and it does something to change the, the protein. Regulatory mutations are those mutations that occur in the non-coding region. They can occur in introns and promoter regions upstream, et cetera, and that those mutations are, um, affect the timing, expression, and location and amount of gene product produced. Okay, and just to give you a little diagram on this. So here's a, I know now that this is, I mean, even from today, this is an overly simplistic view of what a gene is, but here's your gene with the exons, the introns, um, promoter regions, um, microRNAs that bind to target sites, trans factors, which could be proteins or anything else that affect the cis regulatory elements. And as what I conceive of as a structural mutation, is some, as I said, is a mutation that changes the structure of what the gene makes the protein. So that can be either an amino acid substitution within the coding region here. It can be a deletion that takes away part of the protein, or it can be a duplication in which a whole gene is duplicated. Okay. Now, so that's what, that's what I conceive of, and that's what I think EvoDevo people mean. The reason I dichotomize this in this way of structural versus regulatory mutations is I think that's what these people are talking about when they tell you how evolution works, that it works one way more than it works another way. This is the way it doesn't work, but I have to tell you both ways. Um, by the way, so some of these changes can affect gene regulation. A duplication of a gene, which just simply doubles it, not only duplicate is a structural change, well, it's a, it makes the, puts the gene present on two places in the chromosome, but it also causes a change in the gene expression. It makes twice as much. Whoops, I have to go back a little bit. There, and here's a paper showing that, for example, that it makes an evolutionarily important difference in some cases. They've recently discovered that the human amylase gene is present in several copies on our chromosomes. I think it's from like two to 15 copies. And that the number of amylase gene copies you have is highly correlated with whether your population eats starch or not. So if you're a Japanese um, or a European, you're gonna get, you have a, many more, well, not many more, but on average you have more copies of the amylase gene than you do in hunter-gatherer populations or Eskimos where they never eat starch. So here we have a duplication of a gene which affects the regulation of a gene and if, in that it affects how much protein is being pumped out. And it is adaptively significant because human populations have evolved to have different numbers of these amylase loci depending on what they eat. Okay, so those are structural mutations, changes in a product. What, are, what do the evo evil people mean by regulatory changes? Well, first of all, let's just take the regulatory changes that aren't regulatory mutations, because remember, I'm talking about regulatory mutations versus structural mutations. Um, here's a regulatory change, as I just mentioned, that is a change in um, sequence of a protein. You can have a, co a change in the coding region, which I call a structural mutation, that affects when where and how much of the gene is produced. It affects the transcription. And we know of lots of mutations like that. That I call a structural change, even though it changes the regulation. Likewise, trans factor changes, mutations in those such as transcription factors, also affect gene regulation, but they're structural mutations. Okay. Now we'll get to the real regulatory mutations, in that there are mutations that do not change the sequence of a protein, but they change where it's expressed, how much of it is made, and when it is turned on. And there's basically two classes of these. There's the things that act in trans. Here's a change in microRNAs, which are not structural mutations because, the, well, it actually, it doesn't make a protein, but it makes an RNA. But they affect the target site and the, whether or not a gene is expressed. These act as in trans, not in cis. That is, if this thing is present on the other chromosome, it will still regulate the gene. And it's a regulatory mutant. But what Evo Devo people are really talking about, so this is the sort of dichotomy I want to present against that of structural mutations, are these regulatory mutations that are cis regulatory mutations. That is, the gene that they regulate sits very close to where the regulatory elements are in the chromosomes. And they include changes in the promoter regions, changes in cis regulatory elements, changes in target sites of a gene, changes in the intron that can affect splicing or expression. All of these changes don't change the structure of the protein itself. They simply change the, it, the nature of its expression. So the real dichotomy that I'm presenting you with and that the Evo Devo people present is, is adaptive evolution based on these kinds of changes. And if you believe Sean Carroll and Austin Hughes and Jim Valentine and Eric Davidson, the answer is yes, these are the changes that are behind natural selection and adaptation versus the other side, which is that it is actually changes in the in duplications and deletions or sequence changes in proteins themselves. So what I want to do for the rest of this talk is sort of look at the argument that this kind of change is more important than structural change, both from a theoretical point of view and from an empirical point of view, that is, what, is, what are the data?
Yeah. I guess I'm not sure what your question is. I mean, can you show that it's, if you mimic an actual evolutionary the change? The hypothesis is that is it, you, there are differences in, in regulation. You should be able, through manipulation, of, to, to revert back selectively those mutations in, in selective genes to mimic what the, the expression in the mouse and the human. Yeah, you could do that. And in fact, I'm going to talk about that later. That's really the only way to attack this question is to do some kind of transgenics or genetic crosses themselves. So let me get back to you on that. But the answer is yes, that's one way of, of answering the question. So the question again is this, how often are adaptations like the camel's hump or differences in, um, and I put a quote, a caveat here, in anatomy because the people that propose that regulatory differences are important think that maybe they're on, only important in body form and not in physiology and behavior and biochemistry, um, are due to cis-regulatory mutations versus structural mutations. So um, as they say in debates, this is the question before the House, and now I'll present sort of both sides of it. And my proposition, again, is that we don't know the answer to this question, despite what you may hear from people both in the popular press and in their scientific lectures. And I published a paper with my collaborator um, on this, Hopi Hoekstra. This is actually the only paper I've ever published on um, evolutionary developmental biology, but it's gotten me sort of into a controversy about this because I've attacked the powers that be. Um, I've done this in collaboration with Hopi, who's now at Harvard. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff in the paper, as well as a lot of stuff that's accumulated since this paper came out, which is like two years ago. Anyway, what we concluded in the paper is simple. We conclude that Evo Devo's enthusiasm for cis-regulatory changes is unfounded and premature. There is no evidence at present that cis-regulatory changes play a major role, much less a preeminent one, in adaptive evolution. But, in the caveat, we hasten to add that future work may show that cis-regulatory change is an important feature of evolution and, as Carol and others suggest, should be others, um, one that should be studied carefully. Okay. So I published this paper just asking for um, a stop and making, opening your big mouth about what the nature of adaptive evolution is. Um, I got in a lot of trouble with Evo Devo people and conflicts in the literature, um, but we did go, we did meet, have meetings of the mind at conferences, particularly to this Evo Devo meeting in Oregon. That's Greg Ray, who's a big proponent of the, of the cis-regulatory hypothesis. You can see he has an Exxon Schmexxon t-shirt on, and then there's myself. We did, uh, ha I mean, when scientists argue with each other, um, they always have genial conclusions, or usually do. So. I have the opposing t-shirt on, which is pro-cis-regulatory, although I'm not pro-cis-regulatory, I'm just calling for caution in the field and, and mostly calling for new data. Okay, so what is the argument that Evo Devo people make about why cis-regulatory change is so important in evolution? There's three separate aspects that you have to consider. First of all, form versus function. Evo Devo advocates claim that cis-regulatory change, change in gene regulation, is important in the development of animal body plans. And they, they're sort of agnostic about, well, what about the rest of the animal, like its behavior or physiology or biochemistry? I want to talk about that very briefly. Then they have a theory about why a priori regulatory, cis-regulatory change has to be more important in adaptive evolution. I'll try to show that this theory is largely unfounded. And finally, the data, which are actually, of course, the ultimate thing that you have to look at when you're saying how nature works. I'll try to convince you that we really don't have enough to answer this question. Okay. First of all, form versus function. Um, Evo Devo people, for a reason that's still obscure to me, claim that it's only the changes in morphology and body plan of animals that evolve by changes in cis regulation of genes. Here's an example um, by Sean Carroll from one of his popular books. The evolution of form is the main drama in life story, both as found in the fossil record and in the diversity of living species. We do not address other forms of innovation because, although they are fascinating in their own right, because they do not concern morphological evolution per se. Okay, well this is a bit concerning because 
Um, they're fast, they're just as fascinating as the evolution of form, but they're not part of the main drama of life story. If you're a biochemist, the main drama of life story is the biochemistry of organisms, and not whether they have fur or whether they're 12 feet tall versus 4 feet tall. So saying that cis-regulatory change is most important in changes in form in terms of, as opposed to other forms of innovation, there's no real reason given here for that proposition, okay? So you have to scratch your head and ask yourself, well, what are they, why do they always concentrate on body form and why not biochemistry and physiology and neurobiology and behavior and all these other aspects of animals, which are, all, after all, adaptive? I mean, we evolved from aquatic ancestors. That didn't just mean that we evolved legs and, and lungs, but we evolved the behavior, we evolved respiratory systems, we evolved the biochemistry and metabolism to live on the land. All that stuff is involved in adaptation too. Why is that not, con why is that considered different from body form in terms of how genes regulate it? And there's two reasons, I think, um, both of them um, wrong. Um, the first of all is that, yeah, form is what you see in the fossil record, okay? Well, okay, and so therefore we're, we're talking about genes that change those kinds of forms that are fossilized. But that doesn't tell you why cis-regulatory change should be involved only in the evolution of form and not so much in the evolution of the stuff that isn't fossilized. So that's not a good reason to say that adaptive evolution involves cis-regulatory change. The other reason, which is never stated, is that we know a lot about the genetics of changes in biochemistry and physiology and behavior, and those are based on, in many cases, on changes in protein structure. I'll show you some examples later. So if you look at what we know about adaptations, it's all changes in behavior chemistry, in chemistry and biochemistry and physiology, and we know almost all of those cases are due changes in protein sequence. So if you just sweep those under the rug, then you can make this unsupported assumption that changes in body form, for which we don't have as much evidence, are based on a different kind of genetic change, okay? So that's the form versus function thing. Um, I just don't see any reason, given that genes that are involved in biochemistry and physiology and behavior are embedded in developmental networks in exactly the same way that genes that are building bodies are, why there should be a fundamental difference in the kind of ways that adaptation operates in one group versus the other. There's no a priori reason I can see to say that evolution has to operate with one kind of genetic change in one class versus another kind of genetic change in another class. Is making a bone strong really involve different kinds of genetic change from making it long? Okay, and the answer is I can't think of any, and not, nor have Evo Devo advocates um, mentioned any. Finally, there's the cis-regulatory imperative. Okay, now we move on to the theory of why cis-regulatory change has to be most important in evolution. Here's a statement again. I'm, I don't really mean to beat up Carol, because I know he was here. I mean, he's a nice guy and everything. It, um, he's just the most vociferous advocate of this viewpoint, which I find some, is, is an impediment to our understanding of how evolution works. The nature of cis-regulatory um, regions constitutes pervasive evidence that the diversion of regulatory DNA is the most available and the most frequently exploited mode of genetic diversification in animal evolution. Okay, that is, there's something about the cis-regulatory elements of genes that make them most available and most frequently exploited in evolution, as opposed to changes in the structure of the proteins that those elements control. Okay, why is that? Well, there's three reasons. First of all, and this is the most common reason, why regulatory regions should evolve faster than stru protein structure? Because they have fewer pleiotropic effects on fitness. If you change when, how much, or where a protein is produced by making a mutation in the regulatory sequence of a gene, that may have fewer bad effects on fitness of an organism than if you change the structure of the protein itself, which after all, when you do that, then you get this altered protein occurring at, at every place where it is done in the cell. But if you change the, pro uh, the cis regulatory element, you may, be, for example, be able just to change where the protein is expressed or how much of it is made, and those are said to have less bad side effects than a change in the structure of the protein itself. So this is the main reason, theoretical reason, why cis-regulatory change is supposed to be more labile, or cis-regulatory elements are more labile than structural elements. Okay, and then there's two other arguments. Many phenotypic differences are easier to get with a change in the regulation because expression of a gene is a continuous variable if you just mutate the regulatory sequence. You could make it a little bit more, a little bit less, so you could change it in the liver and not in the stomach, or et cetera, and that might be a good thing for evolution. And finally, most coding mutations are recessive and therefore immune to regulation. 
therefore, this is the most egregious misapprehension, as I'll try to show you. Um, therefore, cis dominant mutations, which are the cis regulatory mutations, must be important in evolution because mutations in proteins tend to be re active recessively. Okay, let me dispose of these two before I get to the most important one. Um, there's other ways to regulate proteins in a continuous fashion besides the changes in the cis regulatory elements. There's also trans regulatory elements. Gene regulation occurs on multiple levels and you can tune it any way you want basically. So there's, this is no theoretical reason why cis regulatory mutations should occur through structural change. Even changes in structure of a gene itself can affect how active it is or how much of it is made, as in the case of the sex lethal gene that I just heard about. Finally, this is just based on an elementary error in genetics. Cis-dominant doesn't mean that you're phenotypically dominant. It means that you express, when there's a mutation in a cis regulatory element, it affects the gene on the same chromosome where the mutation occurs. That's what cis-dominant means. But it doesn't mean that that gene is dominant in the phenotype. That is, that a cis regulatory mutation that's cis-dominant will also be phenotypically dominant, okay? This is just a mistake in the part of developmental biologists on what recessivity and dominance means. But we still have to deal with this um, pleiotropy expression. Okay, so first of all, my, my arguments against are these. Why you can't just say that the, there's more detrimental effects to changing the structure of a protein than changing its regulation. First of all, this, we don't really know if changing the time or place of when and where a gene is made has fewer pleiotropic effects than changing the structure of its product. We know of some mutations in regulatory regions that have huge pleiotropic effects on the organism. They don't just affect that particular gene or timing of it, that they, have, they interact in a network of development to cause changes in a lot of other genes as well. The probability of fixation of a new mutation doesn't just depend on the pleiotropic effects of that gene but on how likely it is to be positively selected. How many mutations occur? Remember, cis regulatory elements may be much smaller than structural genes, we don't really know, and therefore the mutations might occur less frequently, um, and the, the proportion of mutations having a phenotypic effect. So there's a lot of other things besides just degree of pleiotropy that affect whether a new mutation is used up in adaptive evolution. And fun, um, gene duplication is a very important method of um, adaptive evolution, and this occurs as a, as a structural change in the protein. We know that there are whole families of genes like the um, various genes involved in the immune system, genes in hemoglobin, et cetera, that occurs gene families, and there are families of transcription factors, and these are all structural changes that have arisen through a process of duplication and fixation. And they haven't caused any negative pleiotropic effects, at least sufficient pleiotropic effects to prevent them from fixation. And finally, the idea that genes that um, Structural change is so deleterious that proteins can't evolve adaptively, predicts that changes in transcription factors will never cause important evolutionary change because a transcription factor is a protein that regulates a lot of other proteins. And that changing that structure is going to screw up everything, according to this argument. So it predicts that changes in transcription factors will not cause important evolutionary change, and that's simply not true. I've heard of several examples just in talking to three or four people today about how transcription factors have evolved positively over time. Okay, so the argument that just because what we know about development says that that a priori cis regulatory change has to be the basis of adaptive evolution is faulty, I think. I mean, you can't just say, okay, this is the way nature's gotta be. If you're an evolutionary biologist, you learn to be deeply suspicious of that, okay. But we ultimately, we have to turn to the facts about nature. What do we know about the genes that are involved in adaptations? Where do the mutations that have involved those adaptations lie? Are they in the co protein coding regions? Are they in the cis regulatory regions? Or are they somewhere else? Okay. Let's look at the genomic data first because this is the data that King and Wilson, we're not going to see this guy much longer, thank God. So, um, uh, the data of King and Wilson that chimps and humans are so similar that changes must be due to cis regulation. What is the data? What are the nature of the genetic differences between ourselves and chimps, and where are they in the genome? Okay, what do we know? And the answer is that you can make an argument one way or the other. There's a lot of evidence that you could adduce to say that, well, it's got to be the cis regulatory changes that differentiate us from chimps. After all, we have that 50, only 1.5% difference in DNA sequences. If you do population genetic analysis, most selection is purifying, pro promoter regions, so positive selection for many genes, 750 compared to introns. 
So here we have adaptive evolution of cis regulatory elements, and there are evidence that, un, that um, human high accelerate, highly accelerated evolution occurs in non-coding DNA rather than coding DNA. But then if you look at another set of papers, you get completely the opposite conclusion. It really depends on who's doing the work. 80% um, of the proteins differ in sequence between ourselves and a chimp. So even though there's only that little genetic difference, it works out to a lot of difference in proteins. You know, only four out of five proteins that a chimp produces are different from the ones that we produce, okay? 6.4% um, of our total genes are missing in chimpanzees or vice versa. Um, I won't go through all this. We have evidence that it, there's lots of amino acid substitutions between those species, which is structural differences and adaptive. Um, the fraction of regulatory mutations different, driven to fixation by selection in humans is not significantly different from zero. So, I mean, this is like the Talmud when you're trying to figure out, you know, well, what do you say about this? And all I can say is we don't know the answer from this kind of genomic scan data. The, what you get depends on what paper you look at and I remain sort of agnostic about this. What about other species? Well, the same thing. In Drosophila, at least, there is some evidence that adaptive evolution between species is driven both by coding and in non-coding regions. Um, in fact, they tend to evolve at about similar rates. Matt Hahn did a study in Drosophila looking at sites that are fixed under selection differing between two species of flies, 54% of non-synonymous um, regions which are in protein, protein coding regions are fixed by selection, as opposed to 30% in putative promoter regions. So there's no, there's no evidence, at least from this, these data, that these regions are evolving much faster than these regions. They seem to be evolving at about the same rate. But again, we don't know. This paper came out about two weeks ago in Science. The proteins on chromosome 21 in humans, if you can put it in a mouse cell line, which you can, are expressed as if they were in the human body so that the regulation of these human proteins is um, driven by something that's on that chromosome with them as opposed from the mouse transcription and translation machinery, okay? And from this, they concluded that the differences between human and mice are rest on gene regulation, but as you probably realize, that's not a valid conclusion. All it shows is that an entire chromosome is regulated as if it were in the human body. We don't know about the differences between human and mice and what caused their differences. We do know that there are 21% of the genes that we have are not found in mice at all. So there's, no, there's you know, the lack of homologs, okay. Pardon? The one with the, well, the one with the, the, actually it's in a cell line. I don't think they have a living mouse with the 21st human chromosome. It would be a mouse with Down syndrome, I think, at any rate, if it had that. So a special needs mouse, so, as, which Sarah Palin would understand very well. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. I can't resist politicking, particularly in Ohio. What about um, single locus data? Um, the genomic data is confusing. You can, there's simply not enough to make a resolution. You really need to look at it locus by locus. And where do you find? You find statements like this from Greg Ray, also by Sean Carroll, and other people that have made tables of these differences. Numerous studies have identified cis regulatory mutations with functionally significant consequences for morphology, physiology, and behavior. Okay, notice that the question has changed a little bit. We're not asking what kind of changes have been involved in adaptive evolution. We're asking whether there are cis regulatory mutations that have functionally significant consequences. Well, you can find a lot of those, and Ray presents a table in his paper, um, which gives an example of cis regulatory mutations with interesting phenotypic consequences. Okay, when you see something like this, that's a red flag for an evolutionary biologist. Um, what do you mean interesting phenotypic consequences? We're trying to talk about adaptation here. So you look through the list and you immediately find something that's sort of distressing, creative dance performance, a vasopressin receptor. Um, and there's another weird one, depression, creativity, and anxiety. What do these things have to do with adaptation? First of all, they're behavior and they're not form, okay? But second of all, I mean, what are these genes and what are they doing? They have interesting phenotypic consequences. For these two studies, you find that the same gene is involved, SLIC6A4. It turns out that there are mutations in SLIC6A4 SLIC -A4, which are associated with more ability to dance creatively. There are also mutations in the same gene that, make you, that tend to be associated with depression, anxiety, and behavior. Okay, two problems. First of all, if you look at the mutations in these studies, the same mutation that makes you dance better also makes you more depressed. Okay, so is it an adaptation that becomes questionable? I mean, it turns you into a, a Nijinsky, I guess, or something like that. But second of all, there's no evidence that these are adaptations at all. 
much less adaptations in body form. They're just mutations in a gene that happen to be associated with behaviors, not even causal, but just associated. They could be linked to other mutations. So you start taking away all these things that don't have anything to do with the question at hand. First of all, take those whose effects of fitness and adaptation in the organism are not known. They're simply things that are polymorphic or we don't know what functional consequences they have. You're left with a somewhat smaller list. Now, some of these are association studies. They're not studies where you do transgenics and move mutations around to see their functional consequences. They're associations with changes in promoter regions or, or structural regions that are um, and cis regulatory mutations that happen to be associated with certain behaviors or structures. So, to a geneticist, this is just an association, not a causality. So you take all those out. Some of these are based on human-imposed selection and not on adaptations occurring in nature, like pesticide resistance, resistance to infection um, with malaria when there's drugs involved. And so you remove those. Um, then you're left with a somewhat small list. And then you get rid of those genes. So we, we have like eight of them left. You get rid of those in which the genetic analysis is weak or inconclusive. There's simply not enough information to say whether these cis-regulatory mutations are actually causal in the phenotype. And finally, you're left with a list of about f four, no, f yeah, four. And then, so malaria infection, lactose persistence, skeletal pattern, and color. You remove all those that are f involved with form. These may all be adaptations, but remember the hypothesis is about body form. So we remove all those and we're left with one, which is the loss of pelvic armor in the stickleback fish when it moves to fresh water where there's no predators. They lose their spines, they lose their armor. That's due to a change in assist regulatory mutation. So we have one study, okay? That, so we have all these interesting mutations, but the only ones that address the hypothesis is a single factor here, okay? Now, actually, there's more. Okay, so I'm just going to give a list of all the ones where I think it's conclusive that a cis regulatory change has affected an important change in an organism's morphology. Um, and we have pretty good genetic evidence that that's true. The absence of bristles in larval Drosophila. Some species have bristles on part of their larvae, other species are missing them. That's due to three changes in cis regulatory region of. Um, the, the gene ovo shaven baby. The problem with that is the adaptive significance of that change is unknown. We don't know whether that's an adaptation or not. And it's the loss of a trait, okay? We know that evolution has caused the bristles to be lost. This is gonna be a recurring theme. There's some species in Drosophila where the adults have wing spots and others don't have them, cis regulatory change. It's the loss of a character, however. Again, the absence of wing spots is a derived trait and the adaptive significance is uncertain. Loss of pelvic skeleton and sticklebacks. The mutations are not known. They're likely to be cis-regulatory. Again, it's the loss of a trait rather than the evolution. I mean, it could be just like a knockout of a gene. In fact, it probably is. Loss of pigmentation in sticklebacks when they colonize fresh water. Again, it's the loss of a trait. The mutations aren't really known that well, but they're probably cis-regulatory. Loss of pigmentation in the fly abdomen. We don't know what the adaptive significance of one fly that's yellow versus another fly being black is. It's just a phenotypic change. It's not necessarily an adaptive change. And the elongation of forelimbs from mouse to, rat, to bat, this is probably the most convincing case of cis-regulatory change affecting a character that's adaptive because they've actually moved a, a cis-regulatory region from a bat into a mouse that's supposedly involved in making wings from forelimbs. And lo and behold, if you move the cis-regulatory region from the bat and you put it in the mouse, the mouse's forelimbs get longer by about 2%. Two six percent. Okay, so that's when they've actually done a, a sort of transgenic experiment. It is almost certainly an adaptation because bats have longer forelegs for a reason, so they can fly. It doesn't affect hind limb region. This is a very good example of a cis regulatory change involved in an adaptation. Okay, but there's only one. There's not a ton of these things. All right, certainly not enough to make the statement that cis regulatory change is the most important thing in adaptive evolution. Okay, in a, opposition to these few studies depending from one to like six or seven, we have at least 60 or 70 changes where changes in the protein structure themselves are involved in a well-known adaptive change. We have like 10 pages of a list of these different genes, whether or not they're structural or regulatory. Almost all of them are S, but I've shown you some regulatory ones, and I'm not gonna go through the list. In opposition, well, I can just say in opposition to um, the paucity of cases in which gene regulation in cis-regulation is involved in adaptive change. We have 
many cases of protein structure involved in adaptive change. Now, this does not mean that structural change has been most important in evolution for a simple reason, which is that there's a, an ascertainment bias. It's a lot easier to find out changes in protein structure involved in adaptation than to find changes in cis regulatory regions. We don't even know what constitutes a regulatory region for most genes. It could be things that are thousands of basis pairs upstream. So they're harder to single out the mutations that are involved in, say, something like hemoglobin, where it's the structure, versus regulating hemoglobin, where it could be any one of a number of changes in God knows how many regions removed from the gene. So there's an ascertainment bias, and we have to be aware of this. Nevertheless, if you look at the existing evidence, all of these mutations versus the ones that are cis-regulatory, you come to the conclusion that you simply can't come down heavily on the side of cis-regulatory mutations. Molecular genetics of crop domestication. Um, this is something that's not really adaptation in nature, but Evo Devo people like to talk about them. But if you look at the basis of changes in, say, corn structure, changes in how crops have changed over time domestically, and see whether those morphological changes, which are all in form, involve cis-regulatory versus structural changes, at least half of them are changes due to amino acid sequences or stop codons, which are structural changes and only three putative cis-regulatory mutations. Now, this is not adaptation in nature. It's artificial selection. Nevertheless, because Evo Devo people cite artificial selection as an example of a field from which you can draw data to support their theory, this is the kind of data we have. And finally, and this comes from a paper in Evolu the latest issue of Evolution by David Stern, despite the fact that there is, he makes the statement that although there is an ascertainment bias, it's easier to find structural and cis-regulatory changes. Now we're beginning to have the technical ability to look at the changes in gene regulation and find these mutations. And so, so surely the number of cis-regulatory changes is going up over time that are involved in adaptations. Um, and sure enough, it is. Okay, but he fails to point out that the number of changes in structural, structural mutations is going up just as fast, despite the, our technical sophistication that's increasing. In fact, coding mutations have outnumbered cis-regulatory changes in evolution by a factor of four to one over time, and that factor is holding pretty constant. Okay. So this is our conclusion that Evo Devo's enthusiasm for cis-regulatory changes is unfounded and premature. There is no evidence at present that cis-regulatory changes play a major role, much less a preeminent one, in adaptive evolution. We hasten to add, okay, note this caveat, that future work may indeed show that cis-regulatory change is an important feature of evolution, and as Carol suggests, one that should be studied carefully. So all we're saying here is, look, folks, we don't have enough data to answer this question. The Evo Devo people may be right, but we simply need more work, okay? Now, that got me in trouble, it got us in trouble, um, particularly me because I'm the loudmouth of them. Um, before I get to what this paper meant in terms of the sociology of science, I just want to make a, three rants about Evo Devo at the end, um, actually things that sort of impact negatively on evolutionary biology that come from Evo Devo. Um, the first one is that if you see a difference in transcription level, between species of a gene and that are correlated with a morphological difference, that does not prove that the genes that are turned on and off have changed between those species, okay? Here's a prime example. In the Darwin's finches, the level of calmodulin protein is much higher in those species that have big stout beaks than have little beaks. Here's the calmodulin level. I don't know how they stay in this. I'm not a biochemist. Um, and here's the paper that show that there's an association between how big your beak is and how much calmodulin protein you have in your beaks. Okay, from this, it is not valid to conclude that changes in the calmodulin gene itself or in its regulation are the mutations that are responsible for those beak changes. We have an association here, not a causation. To prove a causation, you have to do some kind of genetic or transgenic work that is moving genes from one species to another or moving cis-regulatory regions from one species to another and seeing if they affect the size of the beak. That has not been done. Nevertheless, everybody from that previous study that writes about this paper is willing to say that it's obviously changes in calmodulin that have caused the evolution of finch beaks. Here's Masatoshi Ne, a very famous evolutionist. Breadth and length and finches beaks are controlled primarily by the expression levels of these two genes, CAM and bone morphogenic protein. 
Okay, this is for Helen, who is in Davis with me. Uh, it's a quote from Mel Green, who's a famous Drosophila geneticist, and I agree with wholeheartedly. It's not genetics if you don't make a cross. You cannot say that something is responsible for a difference between species A and species B unless you can prove it by either crossing them together and doing the genetics or moving the genes themselves from A to B or vice versa and seeing if it affects the phenotypic change. That's the answer to your question. Um, without being able to do that, all else is speculation. Okay. So we always have got to be advised when you see something like this that without the proper genetics, it's a correlation. It's not a causation. Okay, that should be simple enough. The mutationist fallacy is my second rant because it's very common in evo devo. That is, if you see, see a mutation in a species, within a species, that mimics a difference between species or that's an evolutionary difference, you, they say you're entitled to conclude that that gene must have been involved in the species transition. So for example, if we see a single mutation that makes a regular sized horse a dwarf horse, like this one, and there, this is a single mutation causing achondroplastic dwarfism in horses, that if you see the difference between Hyracotherium, the ancestral horse, and the Equus, the modern horse, that's of the same kind, difference in body size, that must be a mutation at the same locus. Okay, that seems dumb maybe to you, but this inference is frequently made in developmental biology. But we know that's not true, and the reason we know it's not true is because we have the fossil intermediates showing that the horse evolution, as Darwin said it would, occurred gradually. Body size increased over millions of years. It wasn't a single mutation. I wouldn't make this point if I didn't see this as such a common error in the literature. Olivia Judson, who writes in the New York Times every Thursday on evolution, a couple of weeks ago said, well, we, there's mutations in chickens that make them featherless on their head. Therefore, the vulture must have evolved its naked head by mutations in the very same gene. Okay. That's the kind of error, which I call the mutationist fallacy, that you have to watch out for. You can't make inferences about how evolution works by looking at mutations, particularly large deleterious mutations in single species. Um, and I'll skip this one. There are not separate sets of genes or mutations that create species versus those that create orders, families, or phyla. Some evo Debo people claim that these big changes in body form that differentiate phyla are different kinds of mutations from those that differentiate families, orders, and species. Um, that's a mistake and, um, which Richard Dawkins has pointed out, and I won't go into that deeply because I want to talk a little bit at the end about the sociology of this paper. Again, I want to emphasize that this paper did not attack cis-regulatory or regulatory mutations as being important in evolution. It attacked the logical structure of their argument by saying that the theoretical basis is unfounded. It attacked the data, which are um, inconsiderable. There's not a lot of data on this issue. We did not take up a position saying, we know how evolution works. And it's the other way from the way Sean Carroll said it works. OK. Um, after we published this paper, the first thing that happened was that Sean Carroll gave a talk at the ESEB meetings in Uppsala, and somebody asked him a question about our paper, and he got pissed off, and he hoped he was in the audience, and he pointed his finger at and said, that, that paper is wrong, and will be short-lived. Um, this is the sociology of science now. This is not science, but just for the younger people. When you irritate somebody by attacking their favorite theory, you get in trouble. And I just want to show you how this happens. Um, first of all, our paper isn't wrong. It can't be wrong because all it did was say that we don't have enough data. Now, if you want to oppose me and tell me, well, we do have enough data to settle the question, fine. But we were not saying that, there is a, that cis regulatory change isn't important. So this public humiliation is one way that these major figures in science can attack those younger people like Hopi who are untenured assistant professors. In fact, um, some, a tenured professor called her up when, I sent, when we sent him a preprint of our paper and said that if you publish this paper, you're not going to get tenure at Harvard. This is a much more serious thing to tell somebody, particularly if they're at Harvard where you're known, which is known to be a dumping ground for assistant professors. So. I want to emphasize again that, and this is finally the way that our paper was misconstrued. I'm almost finished now, but this is, again, we're on the sociology of science. What we did not say, the paper is a simple paper. It makes one simple point that we don't have enough data. We did not say that gene regulation was not important in evolution. I hope you've convinced you of that. Second of all, we did not say that cis-regulatory mutations are unimportant. We said we don't know, and they're liable to play a role, but we don't know how big that role is. We have this statement. We hasten to add that this is a statement from the paper that cis regulatory change can be important and one that should be studied carefully. We did not say that structural mutations are the main force in adaptive evolution. It's an alternative suggestion to cis regulatory change, and there is some evidence that it may play a role. And despite this, people have said in their literature 
that another school of thought, now I'm another school of thought, maintains that changes in amino acid coding regions leading to new protein structures are the key to functional evolution. And then it cites that paper. But we didn't say that, okay? <laughs> we did not say that Evo Devo was unimportant, okay? And we've been accused of that as well. Here's a statement by a, an anonymous philosopher of biology, um, who, who I wasn't allowed to use his name, who published a paper that said recent criticisms of Evo Devo are unconvincing. Evo Devo, recent empirical research suggests that Evo Devo does contribute to evolutionary theory. Well, we didn't say it didn't. Um, it's baffling to me how, what, you know, it can be misconstrued. This is the blog Pharyngula. If you're an evolutionary biologist and you're an atheist, you probably read this thing um, by P.Z. Myers, and he said that he characterized me as a significant detractor of Evo Devo, which I was not. With due respect, I'm a critic, but I'm not a detractor, okay? Obviously, we can still not make sound generalizations about the molecular basis of adaptation. Okay, this is, the, this is the sentence in the paper that angered people the most. When we quoted Carl Sagan's famous statement, Carl Sagan was repeatedly asked, much to his irritation, to speculate about whether there was intelligent life on other planets. And he always had this answer, it's okay to reserve judgment until all the evidence is in. That's what our view is towards the view of the genetic basis of adaptive change. And for some reason, this view that we should withhold evidence is irritating to people. I mean, we should withhold judgment. People want to make judgments before the evidence is all in. Now, why do they want to do that? I mean, we're scientists. Darwin, as we know, is very careful. He didn't publish The Origin until 20 years after he'd begun collecting evidence for it. He did not want to be wrong. He wanted all the data to be on his side before he made his statement. Okay, why do people do that? Well, there's a simple answer. It's, and this is given by my old mentor, Dick Lewinton, when he was talking about Steve Gould. That's what I tried to say about Steve Gould. Scientists are always looking to find some theory or idea that they can push as something that nobody else ever thought of because that's the way they get their prestige. This is the big elephant in the room, okay? You get famous if you propose a new theory, especially an evolutionary theory that shows that Darwin might not have had it all wrong. They have an idea which will overturn a whole view of evolution because otherwise they're just workers in the factory, so to speak. And the factory was designed by Charles Darwin. In other words, in order to make your name in evolutionary biology, you have to say that I have an idea which completely changes our view of how evolution works, the Darwinian synthesis, okay. Now, lest you think that I'm exaggerating the attraction of fame and repute to the people that raise these theories about Evo Devo, here's a statement from one of them, which I won't attribute. Over the past two decades, a new revolution has unfolded in biology, note the word revolution. Advances in developmental biology, dubbed Evo Devo, have revealed a great deal about the invisible genes and some simple rules that shape animal form and function. Much of what we have learned have been so stunning and unexpected that it has profoundly reshaped our picture of how evolution works. And when I read words like this in popular press, <laughs> it brings to mind another revolutionary, Lennon. Nevertheless, you can read all this cant about how, fam how evolution works, but you always got to ask yourself in the end, this is the great question of Clara Peller, which most of you are probably too young to remember, which is where's the beef? And with that, I'll end. I'll take any questions that you'd like. Thank you. Questions? Arguments? Yeah. You have to sort of, I think the way you need to do that is you have to go, you have to do a top down study. Instead of looking at finding those genes that have polymorphic expression and then intuiting that they're an important adaptation, first you find the adaptation. Okay, like the camel's hump or something. This is the way my colleague Hopi Hoekstra works, actually. Um, and she finds differences in mouse color. Then she looks for the genes that are involved in that color. And you, that you can do by genetics or transgenics. And then you can move bits of, from one mouse to another or one species to another by transgenics to see if it's different. You, I mean, I, I gotta emphasize again, you cannot answer the question of what the genetic basis of adaptation is simply by looking at polymorphisms in natural populations. 
because the kinds of genes that vary in populations may not be the kinds of genes whose, that changed over adaptive evolution. There's no substitute for the Mel Green's dictum that you got to do these genetics. I don't see any way to show what genes differentiate us from chimpanzees, for example, since you can't make hybrids, or at least one guy tried to make hybrids, but he was unsuccessful back in the 20s, um, without doing some kind of transgenic work or crosses. That's why I work in Drosophila species you can cross, but the vast majority of species like the camel, I mean, we may not know the answer. So some questions you just can't answer in biology, and this may be one. Um, it takes a long time to answer each adaptation question. Well, thank you for that illuminating talk. Yeah. Uh, so one of the dilemmas with what you're arguing is how do you go from getting a single mutation that you can characterize in the laboratory, you can even swap it between animals, and often the case will be that if you swap a single event that was changed in the DNA code, you most likely won't get a phenotypic difference. You have to make many changes. Even if you move the single regulatory element of even one of the Hox complexes, you still may not get the desired phenotypic difference, and that's the gold standard, right? You move between species that teach my students that all the time. Um, but what if you don't get a phenotypic difference? And if you get the phenotypic difference, it's still not good, because we don't know whether that has adaptive fitness properties or not. So we, I don't think we'll ever get to the level that you're hoping that we can have, because you not only have to show the genetic change, but then you have to swap it and make sure that genetic change is positive, and if you show that it's positive, it may be a small enough change that you can never fully appreciate the adaptive fitness potential of, it may take 50 changes to get to the adaptive fitness potential. That's true. Um, yeah, I mean. So we'll yeah, and the answer is, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and there's, look, I can't give you a simple answer to this. The fact is, if evolution does work by the accumulation of many genes with small effect, then if you swap single ones, you're not going to see anything. You don't have that kind of power. Although they did do it in the, with the mouse to the bat thing. I mean, they swapped, they put a bat promoter region, a single one into a mouse, and lo and behold, the forelimbs got longer. Now, whether or not you believe, Two percent, yeah, now, of course, but it's, I mean, it was repeatable and they could find that. Now, whether or not you believe that that's a gene that rodents changed to evolve into bats, because I think that's where bats came from, that's sort of your taste. Um, there's another way to do it besides transgenics, and that's you take species that are closely related enough that you can cross them and do fine structure genetic mapping and show that a small region of the genome is where the change resides. That's why I work on Drosophila, because many closely related species in Drosophila you can cross. Unfortunately, when you do that, you're limited to changes in like body color or wing spots and the really interesting changes in evolution, like where the limbs came from or you know how we lost our tails or lost our fur. You, um, you know, you can't do that. You have to, you're limited to transgenics. So if evolution really does work by the accumulation of many changes of small effect, then we're, we're, we're screwed. <laughs> I think, though, that sometimes evolution may have, be, have an all good genetic basis. At least that's what we see from our work in Drosophila and maybe in other species as well. So I think you just have to try it, you know. Um, but I think people are a lot more optimistic about what this research program can provide than than is warranted because of the problems you pointed out. And I don't know the answer. I don't know any substitute for genetics to answer this question. There isn't any. Neil? Yeah. Do you have any um, insight into how they came up with the notion that cis regulatory changes are less likely to be pleiotropic? Well, it's, it's, yeah. You can argue that it would be the other way, depending on, I mean, again, there's no one necessary pattern that has to hold because you can imagine amino acid substitutions that are effectively silent. Or ones that are slightly unsilent, and you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. Maybe a year continuum. So I don't really understand. I mean, you start moving a protein position around, you could have all sorts of unintended. Yeah. Um, my answer is I mean, I don't know why they came to it. The thing is, it sounds appealing to people if you don't think too hard about it. To say, well, you have these cis regulatory elements. If you just change it a little bit, maybe you can make it just 1% more of the protein in the liver and, and no other change, you know? Whereas if you change the structure of the protein, you're gonna screw it up completely. It's gonna be affected everywhere else. But a small amino acid change in a protein could have the same effect of maybe having an effect in one organ or not in another or affecting binding of different kinds of factors, et cetera. So, I mean, I'm not the person to ask where this idea comes from, but um, I think the reason it's pot, I can. Figure out even how they yeah, how, on that well, 
Yeah, I think, well, I think my next to last slide is the answer to that. You know, if you can make, you know, it gets you famous if you can make it. I mean, the idea is appealing to the popular audience. I can say that. If you go in front of an audience of regular people and say, look, mice and humans are identical and all their, they have all the same genes, but they differ in how they're used. So these promoter regions have to be the key to adaptive evolution. They're going to believe you. And a lot of the fame that Evo Diva people have acquired has been come through popular works rather than from um, this. I hear Sean Carroll's going to get a NOVA show, um, a NOVA program, which will undoubtedly highlight the importance of cis regulatory changes. So, yeah, I mean, I, the reason we wrote the paper is we thought the theoretical case was weak. And you can find a lot of changes in protein sequence that have very little pleiotropic effects. Duplications, for example. I mean, you duplicate a gene, you have no pleiotropic effects. <laughs> you just have twice as much. Well, it could have some pleiotropic effects, but it doesn't cause pervasive screw up of the genome. We've had two rounds of whole genome duplication in our evolution of the tetrapods, and that certainly has not screwed up our evolution. Our polyploid plants evolve all the time through duplications, yeah. One would think that one should be able to swap a mouse for a rat or vice versa. How feasible is it? Did people look at those regularly? Did you read uh, did you see I don't know. I mean, you said, to do that ex experiment, You'd have to be interested in the evolution of rats or, or mice. I don't know which one is derived and which one is ancestral. But the people that work on mouse genomics aren't interested in mouse evolution. So uh, I would, really couldn't answer that question. I mean, if I were in this business and I was working on mammals, I'd find stuff like two species of mice where you could cross them that differ in That's what my colleague Hopi does. They have a white mouse that lives in white sand, a brown mouse that lives in the dirt. You know, obvious adaptive difference for predator prediction. You can cross them and find out that it's MC1R. Um, rats and mouse, you could do transgenics in living animals. So yeah, I, I don't know the feasibility of that. But certainly, the more closely related two species are, the easier it is to answer these questions. But then you can't answer the questions of like, where does the camel's hump come from? Why does the shrimp have its legs on one side and the brachiopla has its legs on the other side, et cetera? So, you know, it ain't genetics if you don't do a cross. Yeah. Oh, what do you mean exactly by that? Well, so if, if, if in an evolutionary sense you get a structural change in the genes, that requires a change in the cis regulatory gene structure as well. Why does it? Well, it may. I'm not yeah, it may. Yeah, sure. You can easily. Yeah. True, and one of, you know, there's lots of genes that are, uh, exemplify that. Um, one of them is hemoglobin in humans. We have fetal hemoglobin, which is a duplicate of our regular hemoglobin genes, and it's also turned on in the fetal period and turned off, well, mostly turned off in, in adults. Um, that's an example where a gene duplication has been a structural change. It's some, subsequently diverged to make fetal hemoglobin more liable to take up oxygen. That's a structural change, because you don't need to wrest the oxygen from your mother's blood. But then you need that gene to be turned on only in the fetus, so you have to after that structural change, you need a cis regulatory change. And there are many, many examples of things that are sort of like that. So, um, so and for many reasons, these two kinds of adaptive evolution are almost inseparable from one another. If you have a new gene product, you may want to turn it on or off at a different time or put it in a different place. So you have both types of change working together. And I'm not denying that. All I'm saying is you know, we don't have enough data to say that one is more important than the other. Yeah. Oh, I've never classified them by morphology versus physiology. It is true um, that most of the changes that we know about that are, are structural changes rather than cis regulatory changes are in physiology and biochemistry rather than morphology. So in that case, um, we simply, there simply aren't enough mutations known that affect morphology. Now, if you look at artificial selection, I mean, all those changes in plants that I showed are, are changes in, more, in um, structure. That's how they were found, because they were through artificial selection. People haven't done a systematic survey of changes. Because when you do artificial selection, you're selecting on the phenotype and the form. You're not selecting on the biochemistry generally. So we really don't, we can't do a chi-score like that. There's not enough data right now. 
you know, maybe the cis, the cis regular, the Evo Devo people will be right, and biochemical changes will be more likely to be structural than um, morphological changes. I, mean, I can't see an a priori reason for that, and everything I know about biology and development, granted it's not a lot, would, would t make me tend to believe otherwise, but, you know, biology is always a surprising endeavor, so, but we don't have enough data, that's the short answer. Thanks.